Welcome to MindShift. I'm Brandon. Today is episode three of my newest series, Dissecting the Divine, where we look at God, an anatomy by Francesca Stravracopoulou. This is my second time going through the book, and I'm learning and catching so many things I didn't the first time, and I hope to be able to distill some of that information down to you. We are going chapter by chapter because this book is so dense, so packed with amazing and interesting information. This chapter is called Footloose versus chapter two, which was Grounded, so things are starting to get a little shaky. And if you haven't seen Grounded, I'd encourage you to go watch episode two. It's not required to enjoy this by any stretch, but it might lay some things out a little more clearly. Within this chapter, we're going to get a second part, which is liftoff. So from grounded to footloose to liftoff, we're seeing a shift in the corporeal nature of this God from someone that was truly planted in the world that he had created, a actual physical presence to be dealt with and felt throughout his people. And we're going to see that transition as we get further away from that corporeal nature. And now it's more about this cosmic, mystical, invisible force with the only real human representation of this God being Jesus Christ. And it was the Christian traditions building off of Judaism that had to kind of dematerialize that former God to make the humanly presence available for Jesus Christ. And we're going to see that tension, especially as we get to the second part of this chapter. I think it's fascinating. I think it's such a clear look at the history of this God that started out in a pantheon of other Canaanite gods that rose to prominence within a certain people group. They got built on top of for another religion that had to reorchestrate and reframe this God in the world to introduce really a new God concept and to further build and change the fact that this God was now becoming a monotheistic God. So how does she start us out? She starts us out by showing a transitional period. Again, I think that's what a huge theme of this chapter is. And we see a relief, the Arch of Titus. This is depicting the destruction of Judah in 70 CE with the temple that had been rebuilt after the Babylonian exile now being destroyed. And you can see the treasures of that temple being carried off. Again, being that we still lived in a poly theistic world at this time. It was never a great idea, even if you did capture another temple or another country, etc., to just destroy their gods completely. And it's a quick example of this reverence we see for the temple treasures or even the gods themselves. So she'll go and show us a second example, this one of an Assyrian palace relief from 730 BCE that shows these ancient southern Levantine gods being carried out from their temple after the cities conquering. This ritualized respect or reverence for other gods made a lot of sense in a world that was still very polytheistic. Okay, maybe our god was better, but we can bring these gods into our temple and become more powerful. We see this happen in the Bible, and we'll get to some of those examples. But there is still honor for these gods, even in their defeat, and we still have to place them among us appropriately. And we have this vision of the gods up in their throne rooms and their hierarchy and their order, and we kind of play that out here on earth. We have kings putting their feet up on their footstools just as we picture the gods at rest. And this means a time of comfort, of peace, the work is done. When someone comes into the throne room, they kneel at the feet, at the footstool to show reverence. But when that king is usurped, what happens? The invading army comes in, they kick the footstool out from underneath the king, and now the king is the one lying prostrate before the feet of the greater king. And it is this balance of power, and it's happening at the feet because it shows the importance of this grounded power. And we see this mapping back onto the gods in multiple parts of the Bible that spans centuries. Whether it's back in 1 Kings, I think it's 2219, we see God feet up sitting in his throne room. We still see a very corporeal God with a view of his throne room and his subjugated angels and the thousands of thousands and the ten thousands of ten thousands of servants and attendants to this God. That is referenced to us in the book of Daniel. So centuries apart and still this God remains the same. We don't have this transition yet. This heavenly realm is so important it didn't separate God's from the earthly realm. It was just in addition to, and they would travel down out of the heavenly realm onto the footstool, which is sometimes the earthly plateau. And so we're going to show a myth here that is not related to the Bible that demonstrates this much before the Bible. This Mesopotamian myth is 15th century 
BCE. And we have a character god, a warrior god, who does not rise to show respect to the representative of a underworld god, Ereshkigal. He stayed seated with his feet up, a position of power, and of disrespect to this other god may be worthy of more respect. And when this happens, battles happen. It becomes a fight for the throne that leads down to the underworld as the rest of the myth goes. The Bible has two versions of this. We have a pre-Lucifer version found in the Old Testament, and she reads that off here. So I'll read it for you. This is from the book of Isaiah. It is Isaiah 14, 12 through 14, I believe. Before I read you the verse, I'll read you what she states here. The Bible, too, portrays ancient anxieties about God's need to defend his throne from challengers. In a poem drawing on much older mythic tropes, a semi-divine tyrant named only as Daystar, son of dawn, ascends Saphon, a traditional name of the Levantine cosmic mountain. This is all in the Bible. I know that we have this picture that, oh, in Isaiah, the day star is leading towards Lucifer, the morning star, etc. And really, that is just a Christian concept built on on top of this. In an effort to unseat Yahweh in his role as the enthroned, Elion, Most High, the title inherited from Eol, as he strides up the holy mountain, the trespassing tyrant mutters to himself, revealing his plot. And this is straight from Isaiah. I will ascend to the heavens. I will rise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit on the mount of the divine assembly, on the heights of Siphon. I will ascend to the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like Elion. So again, we see this very common trope traveling from the underworld to the high world to challenge at the feet of the more powerful god with some kind of ending creating what would be our underworld and that is the luciferian story that comes to us in the new testament except in that one it's a bit more explicit where we see that the satan character challenges god is ultimately defeated cast out into the lower realms or where we get hell now and i love this example this story from isaiah and then from the New Testament, showcasing that both of these are just tropes played off in even earlier ancient myths. And you can just see them evolving as the religion moves and continues to evolve itself, always pointing back to the Old Testament saying it was there all along. We have claims that Jesus is right there in Isaiah. Nope. That the Satan is right there in Isaiah. Nope. These are different figures of their time that because of the prophetic poetry in the nature of them, even though they were for that very time and place, get mapped on to Jesus and Satan, etc. She goes on to give us an example of an Ugarit story of Baal having such a gigantic throne that even when he gets someone that finds worthy a great warrior, the feet dangle when sitting in Baal's throne. Not having firmly rooted feet or feet that could reach the floor to be grounded was a sign of weakness that showed then Baal's supremacy even over the greatest of warriors. And she continues showing us that by myth and myth and then bringing it back into the Bible. So then another myth, a more ancient Mesopotamian god, Anu, the god of all creation, the cosmic god, whose son is at his feet in his rightful place, worshiping for years and years and years, one day decides to try and usurp his father tail is old as time, no different than Yahweh and Ale. And as he goes after his father, his father flies up and the son catches him by the heel, by the foot. And as he yanks him down, he also bites off his genitals. Because what is more emasculating, the symbolic emasculation of biting the genitals off than losing your foothold? It's very metaphorical, very figurative, showing the importance of where the feet firmly are in the ancient worlds of gods. She then shows us that same trope with Zeus as he usurps his father, Kronos, and when Zeus fights the cosmic monster, he gets the tendons from his feet cut out. And it isn't until he gets those tendons, his feet back under him, that he is able to secure his throne entirely. Again, we see the importance of the feet and also the weak spot of the feet, just like the back of the heel being the vulnerability for Achilles and Troy. And it worked its way into our Bible as well with Jacob. Jacob means what? Supplanter or heel taker. Just as he grabs his brother Esau in the womb by the heel, so then he wrestles with God to become Israel. It's all really amazing how it works together. And again, the evolution of these myths and the matching on to the new gods, to the new lore, to the new myths. She then gets back on track with some of the stories about battling and taking between gods, and we get that great example from Samuel in the Bible at Shiloh, and this terrible loss to the Philistines, who eventually would end up actually stealing the ark. I'd like to know how that happened. You've got God's own people trying to balance the ark from falling over, and they die just by touching it, but God's mortal enemies, the Philistines, can just somehow handle it perfectly. But they do, they win this battle, and it's also 
really interesting to understand what would have been going on in this ancient battle. Because at one point, when the Israelites are losing, they call back to the temple of Shiloh to get God, to bring out the Ark of the Covenant. Because where God's feet are, that's where he is. And remember, the Ark of the Covenant is the footstool of God, which because of its place of importance also contains a lot, an immense amount of physical, magical power. And you even see the Philistines realize this. Oh no, they're bringing their gods down. So the Philistines do the same. And what would have really been happening is probably, and it sounds so silly, these people take, and at this point, she points out a verse in Numbers that I'll read to you. This is Numbers 10, 35 through 36. So it was, whenever the ark set out, that Moses said, rise up, O Lord, let your enemies be scattered, and let those who hate you flee before you. And when it rested, he said, return, O Lord, to the many thousands of Israel. It was like this little incantation that Moses would do. Wherever the ark was, God would be there also. It was an invitation of God to go on the move with them, to come back and rest after victory. And we see just how man-made these concepts are and these myths are and these representations of these gods. But we're going to go ahead and skip on to the second part, liftoff. And we get this really interesting myth from the late Bronze Age, which leads into where we will get Yahweh from, this Canaanite pantheon of Ale and Asherah. Ale is so glad to see Asherah that what does he do in joy? He puts his feet up on the footstool and wiggles his toes. But she brings bad news. Baal, a powerful god, has died or has descended into into the afterlife or the underworld. And Ael is so grieved by this that he moves from heaven to earth. He moves from his throne to his footstool. He is now sitting on his footstool, the earthly realm. And he then lowers himself further from the footstool to the ground, going into the underworld to retrieve Baal. He brings Baal back, and it isn't until Ael is back on his throne that all becomes right in the world again. Nothing was working when Ael had descended from heaven to earth and then from earth to the underworld. Does this sound familiar at all? So Yahweh keeps this up in the Jerusalem temple and in the Jewish traditions. We have so many accounts in the Psalms and in the Old Testament of God up in the throne room, seated on his cherubim, with his feet on the footstool. And what was the footstool. We get different evolutions of it from the ark to the entire temple to all of Jerusalem to the entire earth. This gigantism of God continues to grow. But then something happens. We get the Babylonian destruction and siege of Judah and the exile of those people. And the biblical writers are trying to deal with this. We see it in Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel. And everyone's asking different questions. What does this mean? Is God just giving us a time out? Has he totally forsaken us? It's this idea that as the enemy comes in Babylon and destroys the temple where God's resting was, lift your feet up, you have to go. But where did he go? Again, did he turn his back? Did he flee back into a heavenly realm? Well, Ezekiel gives us a very different different answer and in a vision contrives this moving God, a vehicle of God on wheels, literally, that requires no man. And so God can make the trip with them into Babylon, where he can always be. In Lamentations, which is typically attributed to Jeremiah, the weeping prophet, we see this quote from Jeremiah, God, you have forgotten your footstool. But Ezekiel, that contemporary, would fix that. No, God's just on the move now. I'll read you that part about Ezekiel really quick. Ezekiel had seen it all. He said, the two cherubim flanking God's throne and footstool had become four, matching the compass of the world, and each of them now perched atop a wheel. As the cherubim lifted their wings and elevated the throne, the wheels turned, and Yahweh rolled out of his temple without lifting his feet or leaving his seat. So it's this amazing image where we can still keep God's power. He didn't have to even lift his feet from the footstool. He didn't even have to remove himself from the throne, and yet he could come with us. This is the most amazing PR or apologetic for a God that had just been defeated. This temple had been completely destroyed, these people removed from their promised land. And as other prophets are trying to deal and explain that God will come back or we can be redeemed, Ezekiel said, nope, don't worry guys, he's coming with us, I've seen it, and creates this mechanism of movement that allows Yahweh to still remain his dignity and his glory with his feet up. I think it's absolutely fascinating. And by the way, this wheel throne idea, this God being able to move idea, we see it in all of the pre-myths. Ishtar on the back of the lions, Baal on a bull, Marduk on his dragons, and even other gods on cherubim, just like God. How interesting. And I think it's important to remember here, Yahweh is just a storm god. How do storm gods move? Yes, they travel on the cherubim, but listen to this quote. He bent the heavens and came down, and a thick cloud was beneath his feet. He rode on a cherub and flew, and came 
swiftly upon the wings of the wind. He made darkness his covering around him, his canopy thick clouds, dark with water. Out of the brightness before him they broke through his clouds, hailstones, and coals of fire. Yahweh thundered in the heavens, the Most High uttered his voice. That's Psalm 18, 9 through 13, and I think it's amazing. I've read the Psalms so many times, and obviously I've read that verse, but knowing the context of a Canaanite pantheon and this particular god, like most gods from most pantheons, having particular powers that are more appropriate to him, storm god, what do storm gods do? They move with the weather, they create bad weather, the hailstones, we've seen this literally, where God threw stones from heaven onto his enemies. Again, this is a storm god, and it's so clearly depicted here in the Bible, these hanging ons to the prior myths. She moves on from here to show us that there were other ways of compensating for this destruction. Ezekiel tries to move God with us, but what does Isaiah or the writer of Isaiah do at the very end of the book in 66.1? Listen to this. Like Ezekiel, the prophet adapted much of older mythological themes to insist that Yahweh remained enthroned, his feet reassuringly planted in the world of his worshipers, no matter where they were. But there was no need for sky chariots and cherubim to illustrate Yahweh's international reach, and no need for a man-made temple to prove his presence. Instead, the gigantism of God proved the deity remained seated in glory. Heaven is my throne, and the earth is my footstool. So that's Isaiah 66 1. Yahweh emphatically declared, Although his temple in Jerusalem lay in ruins, Yahweh's cosmic supremacy was undiminished, and his feet were still firmly fixed in the earthly realm. So Isaiah takes God and says, We don't have to have him in the temple. We don't have to have him moving. We'll just make him so great, so big, that his head is literally up in the heavens while his feet are planted on his entire footstool, the entirety of the earth. So yes, they may have destroyed this portion, but God's feet are on everything. So we're already seeing this tension of how are we going to explain God? The fact that we used to have a God that walked with us and was with us, a God that has been destroyed now, a people that have been scattered. And this continues on into the time of Christ and the early Christian church and church fathers. Except here, they don't like all of the corporeal natures of God. They want to make it allegory and metaphor. They want to demystify things like the ark. Okay, yes, it was a ritual and it was brought into battle, but it is the housing of the Ten Commandments and nothing more. And we will illustrate that in the temple periods by placing the Torah into these little arks where we house the word of God. We will take him from the material, the physical God, resting his feet on his footstool, the ark. And the ark is now just a place where we carry the teachings of this God. And all of a sudden, this idea of a real, corporeal, manifested on earth image of God is getting looser and looser, more metaphorical, more allegorical, and so much of it is turned into symbolism. I'm going to read you two last quotes and then we'll be pretty much done. A favorite tactic employed by early Christian theologians was simply to reduce all biblical references to God's body to the symbolic. When the scriptures instructed people to worship at God's footstool, it was towards the cross to which Christ's feet were nailed. Another strategy, of course, was simply to insist that biblical references to God's body parts were metaphorical and and allegorical, and were not to be taken literally. Reverence rather requires an allegorical meaning, wrote Clement of Alexandria. Listen to what he says here, a very early church father. This is like 150 to 215 CE. You must not entertain the notion at all of figure and motion, or standing or seating, or place, or right or left, as appertaining to the father of the universe, although these terms are in scripture. Instead, Clement argued the biblical ascription of body parts to God was a divinely directed accommodation to the limitations of human understanding standing. Some early Christian theologians navigated the disorienting portrayals of God's feet by bending and stretching the temporal dimensions in which God was understood to walk. When Adam and Eve had heard God walking in the garden, it was actually the sound of Christ as the pre-existent spoken word of God moving towards them. And all of a sudden, bam, we have a huge shift. She gives us another example of a church father origin who is so baffled that anyone would still believe in this physical God, and he just chastises them for their stupidity in not seeing the clear metaphor of the Bible. And on begins common modern apologetics. We take things literally when it's convenient, but when we can't explain something, or when something doesn't seem to add up, or when we just don't have any evidence of this God anymore, compared to the earlier readings where he was so common amongst us, we have to rely on metaphor 
symbolism, imagery, etc. At some point, this group could only hold on to the myth and the fairy tale of a god that used to walk with them when they combined these stories in exile and post-exile. And then when he continued to not show up, and we see that in the Bible, there's this lack of presence after they rebuild the temple after exile. And the newer generations are like, where is this god? Where is this power that was always talked about? And now we have to find a way to recategorize and reframe this god. And that's what happens. And it leaves a place to be filled, not prophetically, just organically by the new church with Jesus. And we'll see that evolution throughout the rest of this book and as we move from Old Testament to New Testament in my secular Bible study series. So hopefully those of you who are watching both series are getting a lot out of it and seeing how the crossover happens and understanding the Bible for what it is in its part of history for the mythology and lore of this particular God. Thank you for watching. If you want to follow along with me, I do have affiliate links in the description to get the book or the audiobook for yourself. This Sunday, I have a second episode of When Christians Respond that his ways are more mysterious, and that's why I can't make sense of the evil in the world, etc. So stay tuned for that. Turn on notifications so you don't miss it. And until then, keep thinking. I wanted to personally thank my top tiers of support, my Iconoclist, GVI, Jacob, Jason, Joe, Oliver, and Sean, my humanist heroes, Jared, Carolina, and Christy, my atheist advocates, Anne, Elijah, Rocket, Sparky, and Todd, as well as all of my secular scholar patrons. If you believe in the mission of this channel, or you just enjoy its content, please consider joining these fine patrons. Thanks, and have a great day.